Hello everyone, welcome back to chapter 9, DNA structure and replication. So at this point, we are going to dive in replication. Now, as researchers resolved the structure of DNA and found that DNA, or at least showed that DNA is the molecule that contains the genetic information, that molecule needs to replicate. Watson and Crick actually thought that the replication is according to a semi-conservative model. That semi-conservative model just simply means that in a double-stranded molecule, as the two strands are going to separate for the replication to occur, each of the strand is going to serve as template so that at the end of the day, when you have two brand new molecules that are synthesized, these two molecules are going to be made up of one helix that is from the template and one brand, new, brand newly synthesized helix so that you always have an old and a new strand in a molecule of DNA that just got replicated. That's what you need to remember. Now, in the semi-conservative model, the end products are exactly identical to each other, provided that there was no mistake during the process of replication, right? So uh, each new DNA, oops, each new DNA double helix molecule is going to have half of what was the original and half of what was the new one. All right. And now, with that said, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, when the DNA is copied, you cannot tell, you cannot tell the difference between the two strands, which one is new, which one is uh, the which one was used as template. You cannot really tell the difference. All right. So say we start with this double-stranded DNA molecule. A semi-conservative model means that this strand is going to be used as template. This strand is also going to be used as template. So the two strands are going to separate. And because each strand is going to be used as template, we have a new molecule right here and a new right here so that we have two molecules of DNA with one, each of them containing a parental molecule and a daughter molecule. All right? So that the two daughter cells are going to inherit the exact same uh, genetic information, provided that there is no mistake during the replication process. All right. Now, the question we need to ask, for that, for that semi-conservative model to take place, what are the different steps in replication? So, first, let's remind that replication is occurring during the S phase of the interphase in the cell cycle, right? This happens before the cell actually enters the mitotic phase, right? So when DNA is replicated, it's separate and the hydrogen bonds holding the two strands together are going to break apart. And this is happening because you have a number of players that are going to force open the two strands of DNA so that the two strands of DNA stay separated. And by staying separated, 
each of the strand is going to be used as template right so basically we are going to have there because of that separation what is called a replication fork and that replication fork is going to allow for the reading of each of the strand the parental strand as template so specifically during the uh, cell cycle you have the parental strand right here that is going to be separated right they open okay as they open you are going to have the enzyme responsible for synthesizing new strands of dna that enzyme is called dna polymerase that dna polymerase is actually going to allow the synthesis of new nucleotides in such way that you are going to have actually the complementary uh, nucleotides that are going to be uh, synthesized so that for G here, we're going to have a C that is added. For A here, you're going to have a T here. For a C here, we're going to have a G. For a T, an A, and so on and so forth, right? Now, remember also that the double-stranded molecule, it's anti-parallel. So the two strands run in opposite direction. Because they run in opposite direction, the two strands that are newly synthesized are going to be synthesized in opposite direction as well, right? But one can wonder, okay, since one is actually going to be read in a sense that the parent strand are being open, how is the second one? being synthesized. In other words, this new strand is going to be synthesized this way, just following the unwinding, right? It's going to follow the unwinding. That's how this is going to be uh, synthesized. So it's easy. However, the other one, let me change the color here. The other one that is going to be synthesized in the opposite way of the, uh, of the unwinding, the question is going to be that, okay, well, what is going to be the waiting time for this unwinding to happen? How much space is needed for the unwinding to happen for the DNA polymerase to come and do its job, which is to synthesize the complementary strand, right? So there is a level of complication here. Let's go back to our original color. So that you are going to have a sugar phosphate backbone of the daughter strand that is going to be formed and closed with the template as complementary strand. All right. So specifically, you are going to have a bunch of enzymes here that are going to be involved in the process. What are the enzymes that are involved in the process? One, you have the helicase. The helicase is this enzyme which job is to unzip, right? Which job is to unzip the DNA progressively. Now, remember that the complementary strands are stabilized by hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are very stable and they tend to reform, right? Now, to avoid these two strands to come back together, you are going to need single strand binding protein, SSB the single strand binding proteins. These SSBs are going to hold 
each, if we draw this guy here, we're going to have another SSB molecule here to hold the two strands open. So that's the job of the binding protein. Then you're going to have an enzyme that is called a primase. That primase is going to produce a new um, few nucleotides worth of nucleic acid sequence here. This small sequence of nucleotide that we call a primer, right? A short primer is going to be synthesized by a primase. Now, the reason why that primer is going to be synthesized is because DNA polymerase, which is the enzymes, the enzyme that do polymerization of the new strand of DNA, it doesn't know how to do polymerization from scratch. It does not know that, right? So the DNA polymerase right here doesn't know how to actually synthesize complementary strands of DNA from nothing here. So you need a primer always. You always need a primer with DNA polymerase, okay? The primase is the one that synthesizes that primer so that now the DNA polymerase will come and start adding the nucleotides here after the primer. Now, in addition to that, there is now another enzyme that is called a ligase. What the ligase does, it's that say you have this strand, right? That is the template. Now, the new strand can be synthesized in such a way that you can have a small segment here and a small segment here. But this segment one and this segment two are not connected together. So you need an enzyme that is going to actually bring the two segments together that enzyme, it's actually called a ligase. A ligase. All right? Now, the ligase does not work in about any newly synthesized strand. Ligase only intervene in one of the newly synthesized strand because one strand is synthesized following the unzipping of the DNA, while the other strand is synthesized by small fragments. These small fragments are called Okazaki fragments. So when you have one Okazaki fragment and another Okazaki fragment and another Okazaki fragment here, you are going to need a ligase that is going to bring these fragments together so that at the end of the day, you have a, a, a piece of DNA that is completely perfect and you would never know that that piece of DNA actually was synthesized out of many fragments of Okazaki. All right? Now, Okazaki is the name of the Japanese researcher who discovered that when DNA is synthesized, the double-stranded molecule is synthesized, you have one strand that is synthesized in a forward manner, while the other strand is synthesized in small fragments, like this, that we call Okazaki fragment, and this Okazaki fragment actually need the intervention 
of ligases, all right? We are going to see that detail a little later. All right. So, when the transcription starts, you're going to have an unzipping. So, the helicase is going to separate the two strands of DNA, followed by the binding proteins that are going to hold the parent strands of DNA. Following that, you are going to have primases that are going to cause the synthesis of primers. So that's one primer. That's another primer. Notice that this primer reads this way while this primer reads this way. So this primer is going to cause a synthesis of the fragment of DNA in this direction, in the direction of the un unwinding. While this fragment is going to be synthesized in this direction, in the opposite direction of the unwinding. So the one that is synthesized in the direction of the unwinding is called the leading, the leading strand. This is the leading strand of DNA. While this one is called the lagging, oops, it's called the lagging strand. Oops, sorry about that. The lagging strand. All right. We are going to address some details here. So, again, you have the helicase that start with unzipping the DNA. The single the single strand binding proteins are going to allow the two strands to remain separate. And then the primase is going to synthesize a primer. Now, what I need to say is that the primer is actually not DNA, but an RNA molecule. So this green molecule here, it's not DNA, it's RNA. Okay? Now, Obviously, we are synthesizing DNA here, right? Now, um, RNA has nothing to do in a final product of DNA replication, which means that there is going to be a player at some point who will have to come and get rid of this primer that is RNA and replace this primer by deoxyribonucleotides, right? Please remember that. All right. So now we see DNA polymerase. So DNA polymerase comes into play. DNA polymerase is going to add from the primer right here one nucleotide after another, after another, after another. And the elongation is going to occur. Now, I just reused a new name, elongation. Actually, when we consider uh, DNA replication, DNA replication occurs in three phases. You have the initiation, the elongation, and the termination. Initiation, elongation, and termination. Initiation, so this is at the very beginning, right here. Elongation, this is the polymerization, right? You see, it's po DNA polymerase, okay? DNA polymerase run reactions of polymerization, right? Po Polymerization. Okay? So I was telling you that we have initiation, elongation, and termination. Okay? 
For now, I'm not going to bug you with that. But understand that DNA polymerase will come into play here. That DNA polymerase add nucleotides one after another from the primer. All right? And then you're going to have this strand that is synthesized in a straightforward manner, the leading strand that is going to go on. The lagging strand is also going to be synthesized. However, it gets synthesized by small fragments, the Okazaki fragments. Okay? All right. So now the leading strand is following, as you can see, but the Okazaki fragment is synthesized by many small fragments. So that's one small fragment, another small fragment. All right? And notice that for every Okazaki fragment in the lagging strand, you need a primer, which means that to create a newly synthesized strand of DNA that is completely DNA, the Okazaki fragment will have to, I mean, the, the machinery will have to get rid of these primers here and replace them with uh, the oxynucleotides, all right? Okay, so the continuous strand is called the leading strand again. Leading strand. While the other one, the discontinuous strand, is called the lagging strand. All right. Okay, the leading strand is synthesized from 5 prime to 3 prime. Okay? Anyway, let me close that parenthesis. So you see the the leading strand that is synthesized, the lagging strand synthesized this way, right? Notice the presence of the ligases, okay? These ligases are there to actually seal the Okazaki fragments together. Now, the only time there will be a ligase in intervening in the leading strand, it's because of the primer that was here, that was actually RNA, right? That is now replaced by DNA, okay? And as this prime, this uh, primers are replaced by the oxynucleotide, this newly synthesized uh, uh, DNA molecule will have to connect with the one that was here so that you have a ligase that is going to do the job here, okay? So the enzyme removes the RNA primers, right? The ligase seal the sugar phosphate backbone, all right? Now, because the chromosome is long, the, our chromosomes are long, you don't have one single fork of replication. You have multiple forks of replication so that this together are going to form bubbles of replications. These bubbles of replications are going to allow replication to occur in many areas at the same time. At the end of the day, this is going to speed up the pace at which the genetic information is replicated at the end of the day, you have two brand new chromosomes with one strand that is a parental and one strand that is a daughter strand here and another daughter strand and a parental strand here. And these two chromosomes are going to end up into two separate cells, right? Into In the two daughter cells. That's exactly what happens when your skin cells reproduce, when your white blood cells reproduce, your liver cells, your muscle cells, and, and so on. Okay? Now, because of all the knowledge that we have about DNA replication, 
actually in a lab, we can now reproduce exactly what we know to happen in the cell. So there is a technology that were developed um, many decades ago called polymerase chain reaction or PCR. Polymerase chain reaction, it's an artificial way of doing DNA replication. Now, because we can do DNA replication artificially, we can actually target very specific segments of our DNA. We can say, for instance, that, okay, well, one person, we know that person to be born without the ability to produce insulin, right? They were born with a defect. They don't produce insulin. Question, can we somehow produce that insulin for that person and just simply inject insulin to the person? If the answer is yes, it's how do we go about producing that insulin? Now, to be able to produce that insulin, which that insulin hormone, it's a protein, we have to isolate the gene that is responsible for insulin production, right? That gene that is responsible for ins insulin production, we are going to isolate that gene using a technique that is called polymerase chain reaction. We use polymerase chain reaction for so many different um, DNA technology um, type of solutions, right? So we are going to use DNA polymerase, okay? That DNA polymerase, we are going to actually use its characteristics to amplify DNA in large amount so that we can actually manipulate that DNA the way that suits our need, right? All right. So this DNA polymerase reaction allows us to amplify pieces of DNA in many copies, more than 10 billions of copies. And typically, we are going to run that PCR following a cycle of one denaturation of the parent DNA, which means we are separating the double helix, right? So that each of the strand is going to be used as a template. We are bringing primers. We are bringing nucleotides, the oxynucleotides, obviously. And we are bringing polymerase. Now, obviously, you are also going to need uh, some salts because you can have protein. I mean, you can have the enzyme, the template, the nucleotide. This, uh, this reaction has to occur in environmental conditions that are suitable for the activity of the enzyme. That's why you need to bring uh, some salts, including magnesium. You need uh, energy in form of ATP, right? So these are some conditions that you are going to use to actually amplify DNA. Now, we are able to do this we do this all the time in our labs. And because of that, we can solve so many problems, including uh, running investigation in forensics, right? We are able to solve crimes using uh, that DNA technology, polymerase chain reaction, okay? So what are the steps? of polymerase chain reaction. So you are going to have, say, a, gene uh, a piece of genetic information. That piece of genetic information is going to have your target sequence of DNA, right? You're going to design primers that are specifically designed to recognize some specific, oops, some specific areas of 
the DNA we want to amplify. All right? Then we are going to have the nucleotide, the small nucleotides, okay? And a polymerase, DNA polymerase. That DNA polymerase has to be particular. It has to be heat resistant so that regardless of how high we bring the temperature, typically we can bring the temperature up to 94 degrees Celsius, which is very high, right? These are temperatures that can actually separate the two strands of DNA. So we bring the temperature up for denaturation of the two strands of DNA. So the two strands of DNA are now separated, okay, by taking uh, temperatures at 94 degrees Celsius. And then we are going to bring the temperature down slowly, okay? Now, this, we do that to allow the primers to come and attach to their matching nucleotides. Once the primers are attached, now the DNA polymerase is going to come, DNA polymerase is going to come and add the nucleotides, right? So DNA polymerase comes and adds the nucleotides. So we go from the first denaturation and hybridization to the first reaction of synthesis. Now we have two molecules. In the next cycle, we are going to have that this molecule is going to be duplicated. This molecule is going to be duplicated so that we have one, two, three, four molecules in cycle two. In cycle three, we are going to have four times two so that we have two, four, six, eight. In cycle three, we are going to have 16. In cycle four, we're going to have 32 so that we are going to have an exponential increase in the amount of the targeted DNA molecule that we needed to amplify. So this is how we can amplify DNA using PCR. Now, so again, this is basically a repeat of what I already said. We are going to select a target sequence. The target sequence, you are going to design primers to amplify specifically that sequence. You're going to need free nucleotides. You're going to need a heat-resistant DNA polymerase. And then you are going to need to separate the two strands of DNA by bringing the temperature up at 94 degrees Celsius. 94 degrees Celsius. Then you're going to do what we call DNA annealing. Annealing. Okay? So the primers are going to attach to the template. That's the hybridization. Okay? Primers hybridize due to base complementarity. All right, then the DNA polymerase is going to copy the target sequence. And then the process is going to be repeated multiple times. In general, we do 30 cycles. And 30 cycles is enough to produce a huge amount of DNA. All right. PCR can be used to solve a bunch of problems, including um, addressing um, species of animals that are going extinct to preserve them, right? Microorganisms that cannot grow in a lab, we can actually 
identify locates organisms that they are really there, right? Um, <coughs> they can be used to characterize a number of things, including one work that was done was to actually determine the age of um, a mummy that was isolated, 70, I mean, 7,000 years old mummy, okay? Um, in the digestive tract of carnivores, we realize that there is actually a food web that is taking place in the digestive tract of carnivores. How do we know that? Well, by showing that there are many, many different kind of microorganisms in the digestive tract of a carnivores, okay? We can show that a type of meat that is sold in restaurant as beef that is, for instance, grass-fed, it's not a beef that is grass-fed, okay? We can show that a piece of meat that is claimed to be beef it's not beef, but it is horse, right? Because there are a lot of restaurants actually that sell horse meat in place of beef meat, okay? Know that that happens, okay? So it is possible to do that. It is possible to show that, okay, well, you are not supposed to, to hunt moose, but you are hunting moose, and you are just using that 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 uh, um, that that meat in hamburger, right? It was also possible to show that um, many many years after the death of Jesse James, and we didn't know exactly uh, where he was buried and people claimed he was buried somewhere so it was possible to prove that the guy who was buried there was indeed Jesse James and finally in forensic science it is possible to show who was uh, the criminal at the crime scene and who was not the criminals there are many people who have been put in jail and who are still in jail uh, while they are claiming their innocence using uh, PCR, it is possible to show that, okay, actually these people, they did not commit the crime because when we look at uh, the stain of blood, for instance, it's not the stain of blood of the victim, uh, but it is the stain of blood of, from the, um, uh, from the, um, the assailant, right? The... Um, the criminal, and that the guy who is in jail is not the one uh, who is matching that, um, that DNA. All right. And then we have another technique that is uh, more for reading the sequence of DNA. That technique is called sequencing. The sequencing technique is what was used to say that the coronavirus, it's actually COVID-19, actually it's a coronavirus. And that that coronavirus, it's not extremely different from the coronavirus that developed in the outbreak that, happened, that occurred in 2002-2003 in Asia. Okay, so it was possible to show, and by the way, a lot of people actually were... Uh, questioning the integrity of the vaccine that was produced for COVID-19 and we're saying that, well, how is it possible that most vaccines take forever to develop, but the COVID-19 vaccine was developed in a relatively short period of time? Well, what we don't know, what many people don't, many people don't know it's that in 2002, in 2002, 2003, when there was an outbreak of coronavirus, 
Many researchers were already working on the coronavirus, except that most of the people didn't pay attention about the work scientists were doing. Politicians didn't care about that uh, outbreak. And eventually, the outbreak went away. So the coronavirus w was under control. And that never became a big issue. However, in 2019, 2020, when the outbreak that became later on a pandemic occurred, well, people, the general public, didn't know that many researchers have been working on coronavirus for a long time and that they even already had vaccines, but they didn't have the means to produce that vaccine. And anyway, no one was interested in buying such a vaccine because coronavirus was not a big deal at that time. But now, when all of a sudden we went from an outbreak to a pandemic that caused the whole world to shut down, politicians and people who run the economy thought, whoa, 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 wait a minute. We need to do something. Well, do we have any solution here? Politicians turned to scientists. And the scientists who were working on the coronavirus for many decades said, well, we've been testing, we've been testing, I'm sorry, we've been testing um, vaccines against the coronavirus. Oh, well, can you produce that vaccine for us? Yeah, we can produce the vaccine. But most of the people in the general population didn't know all of that. But me, as a microbiologist, I knew that, right? And by doing sequencing, it was possible to show that the trial of vaccines that scientists had been doing on animal models were actually also compatible with fighting COVID-19. And this is how, out of a neglected disease, we obtained a vaccine in a relatively short period of time. But, you know, most, pop most people in the population didn't know that. Anyway, let's come back to sequencing. So in terms of sequencing, you have different techniques of sequencing. You have the Sanger sequencing. That Sanger sequencing is going to sequence individual genes. Well, not just individual genes, but for now, we're going to focus on individual genes, right? It's it, it, we're going to sequence individual genes, check for the accuracy of the selected sequence area, and see if someone has a gene that is mutated or not mutated. Remember, we talked about single nucleotide polymorphism some time ago, right? We can tell using sequencing and specifically Sanger sequencing if there is a single nucleotide polymorphism in a population for a particular gene, right? We can actually deduct the sequence, not only of one single gene, but also of an entire genome, right? So here, it's a piece of work I did when I was a PhD, okay? This is a piece of work I did when I was a PhD. So I wanted to show, I wanted to show that the, the uh, gene I was working on was controlled. Its expression was controlled. Now, I was working on two genes. One was called E-T-E. 
H A. The other one was called E T H R. E T H R is the regulator. E T H A is the activator. That activator was actually able to cause a better treatment of tuberculosis using a drug that is called ethionamide. But let me close that parenthesis. We show, I, was sh I showed that ETHR is a protein that can bind on a very specific region of DNA and by binding on that region of DNA, it can shut down gene expression for ETHA. But how did I show that ETHR can bind on this very sequence of DNA? I mixed the protein ETHR in presence with the target DNA molecule. And here I'm using increasing concentrations of my protein. And you can see that progressively there are pieces of DNA that are covered, right? So you don't see the reading of the nucleotides here. So we have some areas where DNA, where proteins are binding. But the question is, how do I know that this is a sequence? So what I had to do is to actually read nucleotide one by one by one by one using the Sanger sequencing technique. So this is how I was able to say that, well, guess what? There is actually in this long piece of DNA a particular fragment where my protein is coming and binding. Then I showed that still using sequencing, I showed that the, the regulator, ETHR, is actually overlapping with the area where the gene transcription is starting. And gene transcription is starting right here. And you see that the protein is binding in all this area. Now, how did I show that? Well, I did show that by actually sequencing my DNA and showing specifically where transcription is starting. And it shows that transcription starts at this nucleotide that is A. And that A stands among G, A, T. Then you have my A. And then I have G, T, T. Okay? In other words, this, are my, this is my sequence right here. Okay? So now using the Sanger sequence, I was able to actually determine specifically which region binds the regulator protein and where is the transcription starting for that particular gene. So you see how sequencing becomes very important, right? Then, now, when I was a PhD, I used the old technique. But guess what? We have what we call next generation sequencing. Actually, next generation sequencing, it's a technology that allows us to sequence a genome in a matter of a couple of hours or couple of days. Now, the initial uh, sequencing of the human genome took many, many years. Today, it is possible to sequence the human genome in few hours. I'm talking few hours, right? Because of the next generation sequencing. It is just insane what we can do, right? So here we are, use, we are going to use a massively parallel approach where we allow many fragments to overlap 
and C are of the overlapping, actually, which, which sequences are similar and which one are different. And the more overlap you have, the more confident you can be about the reading of the sequence, right? Now, the first sequencing took 10 years to obtain the whole genome, but now it's happening in a matter of hours. So basically, you can see that actually when we do the sequencing, we are going to use nucleotides that stops the reading. So whenever, so we have a number of nucleotides and some nucleotides actually do not allow polymerization once these nucleotides are inserted in the sequence. For instance, when DNA polymerase is reading, if it inserts this T, there is no more nucleotide that is going to be added. In place of that, if you have a normal T and a deoxy D, um, a D deoxynucleotide that is inserted here, then the fragment is going to stop here. Okay? So you have a normal. Uh, a normal nucleotide here, a normal nucleotide, and a modified nucleotide so that there could be no, no more insertion. And we do that progressively so that we are going to say that this sequence is A, this, I mean, I'm sorry, T, this one is A, this one is G, this one is A, C, T, A. Because of, you know, you are stopping each time, right? And now you're going to have all these bands and each band is going to tell you that the strand, I mean, uh, the DNA is this much long, right? With a difference of one nucleotide each time, okay? So the DNA fragments are ordered by size, okay? You have a laser highlighting the end base, right? And here we use, this uh, days we use cyber green to name only those, right? And then we're going to determine the sequence. So here you have a sequence reading so that you know that, okay, we have G, C, T, 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 okay? So this is a T, this is a T, this is a T, this is a G. This is a G. So based on actually the peak, we are confident this peak is so tall that this has to be a G, right? So that we have a whole sequence that we can read like this. And this is how we can read a whole genome sequence, all right? So this is where we are going to stop our conversation today. Thank you for your attention. I will talk to you later.